you are about to take a massive leap into a time machine that whisks you beyond the tales of Columbus and European settlers. Picture this as an epic exploration, not just of dates and events, but of the incredible stories woven into the fabric of the rich Native American history. You might wonder how far back we are talking about. We will rewind to when the first humans set foot on these lands. Imagine a time when the Bering Land Bridge was more than just a theory, it was an actual pathway for early travelers. It's not just about scientific jargon. We're diving into stories and ideologies passed down through generations. Stories that make history feel alive. Think of it as an archaeological treasure hunt. But instead of gold, we're uncovering ancient cities and artifacts that tell tales of bustling civilizations. So, why does this matter? Because Native American history isn't just a blast from the past. It's a living, breathing legacy that echoes in the languages spoken and the traditions kept alive. So join us here on Native Journals as we step back to discover the wealth of Native American history and the enduring spirit of their cultures. Before we get into the details, kindly like this video and subscribe to this channel for exclusive access to the wealth of our content. Let's set the ball rolling by examining some indigenous stories on Native American origins. Indigenous tribes have rich and distinct oral traditions that provide vivid narratives explaining their ancestral origins. These stories often talk about how their people emerged from caves, came up from the ground through springs, or have a connection to underground sources. These stories are important because they hold the history and spiritual beliefs of the community and help people in the tribe feel connected to their land and their shared past. These stories are like a guide that helps tribal members understand who they are and where they come from. They show the strong ties between native tribes and their land, passing down essential knowledge from generation to generation. The Navajo creation story called Dine Bahane is an extraordinary tale for the Navajo people. In this story, they believe that long ago, their ancestors went on a fantastic journey guided by powerful spiritual beings called the Holy People. This journey took them through different worlds, each with its challenges and important lessons. After going through these different worlds, the Navajo people finally came to the world they live in now, the Glittering World. This world is colorful and significant to them. It marked a new beginning for the Navajo people when they arrived here. The Iroquois creation myth tells the story of the Sky Woman, who fell from the sky and was caught by birds before landing in the waters below. With the help of animals, she created North America by spreading mud on the back of a big turtle. The Sky Woman then created stars, the moon, and the sun, giving birth to twin suns, sapling, and flint. Sapling created what is good, while Flint created what is terrible. After a conflict, Flint was defeated and forced to live on Big Turtle's back, occasionally causing volcanic eruptions. The myth emphasizes the Iroquois people's respect for animals and their role in the world's creation. This narrative also underscores the interconnected relationship between people and the natural world, emphasizing a profound sense of respect and gratitude for the Earth as a provider of sustenance and life. The Hopi creation story describes the origins of the Earth and living beings through the actions of Tawa, the Sun God, and Spider Woman, the Earth Goddess. In the beginning, only Tawa and Spider Woman existed, and they willed the Earth into being between the above and the below which were previously only occupied by the endless waters. Together, they created the first magic song and decided to make beings like themselves to rule over and enjoy the lesser creatures. Spider Woman shaped their thoughts into women and men, thus bringing life to the earth. Another noteworthy, intriguing narrative stems from Cherokee beliefs. According to the Cherokee story about how everything began, a giant bird called the Great Buzzard flew across the earth, shaping it with its wings. 
This flight made mountains, valleys, and rivers. The first man was made from red clay, a special dirt as the earth took shape. The story says that the first woman was created from a part of the first man's flesh. This story shows how the Cherokee believe the earth and people are connected. The first man and woman were made from the earth's materials, emphasizing that humans and nature are linked. Some controversial theories on Native American origin cannot be overlooked. The first theory is the Bering Land Bridge Hypothesis which has triggered many controversies for many years. It is a foundational theory explaining early humans' migration from Asia to North America during the last ice age. The hypothesis posits that during the Pleistocene epoch, approximately 15,000 to 20,000 years ago, sea levels were significantly lower due to ice accumulation in glaciers. This resulted in the exposure of a land bridge known as Beringia, connecting Siberia in the ASEAN continent and Alaska in the North American continent. Early human populations, often called Paleo-Indians, are believed to have migrated across Beringia, taking advantage of the navigable land bridge. This migration route allowed these groups to disperse southward into North America. How the first Americans got into Beringia is another controversy that leaves archaeologists divided on whether these folks got there on foot or by boat. Some think the first Americans strolled through an ice-free corridor on land, but that doesn't quite match up with the early pre-Clovis sites we found. They're too ancient to fit the timeline of the ice-free corridor. For some experts, a more believable idea is that pre-Clovis humans arrived in America by boat. The western coastline of North America was ice-free way earlier than the interior. Picture this, pre-Clovis humans crossing the Bering Land Bridge on foot and then hopping into simple boats to glide around the glaciers, making their way down the west coast of North and South America. The coastal migration theories present a captivating alternative to the more conventional Bering Land bridge hypothesis, suggesting that early inhabitants of the Americas navigated the Pacific shoreline, relying on nautical skills and adapting to coastal environments. This hypothesis challenges the traditional land-based migration models and envisions a scenario where ancient populations explored the Americas using maritime routes. The archaeological evidence supporting the coastal migration theory is crucial in establishing the Pacific Northwest coastline as a feasible pathway for human migration into the Americas. The discovery of human artifacts and remains along this coastline provides concrete evidence of human presence in the region, indicating that it was a viable pathway for migration. Moreover, Genetic evidence from the area supports the idea of a different migration route predating the ice-free corridor, further reinforcing the plausibility of the coastal route as the possible pathway for initial human migration into North America. Additionally, the discovery of a Mastodon Boney projectile point in Washington State, dated around 13,800 years ago, is particularly significant. This finding suggests that humans were hunting large fauna in the region before the Clovis industry of stone tools emerged, indicating an early human presence along the coastline. These archaeological findings collectively support the argument for the coastal route as a feasible and likely pathway for the initial migration of Homo sapiens into North America. Archaeologist Tom Dillahay's discoveries at the site of Monteverde in Chile provide evidence of human activity dating back to as early as 19,000 called BP. These discoveries include spatially discontinuous occurrences of stone artifacts, faunal remains, and burned areas, indicating that human presence in the area was not continuous but occurred in discrete episodes. Furthermore, exotic raw lithic materials and plant species from Pacific coastal locations and possibly from deglaciated passes through the Andes to the Argentine steppes, indicate a connection between the human presence at Monteverde and coastal migration. This supports the coastal migration theory, suggesting that the successive human presence in the Monteverde area 
during the specified period was likely linked to Pacific coastal locations. Another primary archaeological evidence is the popular Clovis culture, which postulates quite a controversial hypothesis regarding the origin of America's indigenous people. Emerging around 11,000 BCE and persisting until about 9,000 BCE, the Clovis people left an indelible mark with their distinctive stone tools. These tools, known as Clovis points, were carefully crafted with bifacial fluting, a unique feature that facilitated their attachment to spears or other hunting implements. The widespread distribution of Clovis, points from Alaska to South America, suggests a rapid and successful migration, supporting the Bering Land Bridge hypothesis as a likely route for the initial peoples of the Americas. Clovis sites are dispersed across North and South America, indicating a remarkable ability to adapt to diverse environments. While the Bering Land Bridge remains a leading explanation for the initial migration, the discovery of pre-Clovis sites such as Monte Verde in Chile raises intriguing questions about alternative migration routes and earlier human presence in the Americas. The ongoing debates surrounding pre-Clovis cultures highlight the dynamic nature of archaeological research and the continuous evolution of our understanding of ancient populations. Several pre-Columbian civilizations built impressive urban centers with monumental architecture. For example, the city of Cahokia in North America had large earthen mounds, while the Inca civilization in South America constructed intricate stone structures like Machu Picchu. Cahokia, a vibrant urban center in the heart of the present-day United States, provides a fascinating glimpse into the complexity of pre-Columbian societies. Flourishing between 600 and 1400 CE, Cahokia boasted a population comparable to medieval London's. The monumental earthen mounds, including the iconic Monk Mound, are tangible evidence of sophisticated engineering and communal effort. The initial epoch, from the arrival of humans in the Americas to approximately 8,000 BCE, is commonly called the Paleo-Indian period. During this time, people traveled all over North and South America, living in similar ways and using similar tools. Like the Clovis people, the Paleo-Indians didn't stay in one place for long. They moved every week or so. They were always on the go, hunting big animals like mammoths and mastodons and other large creatures like the short-faced bear, giant sloths, moose, and beavers. For tools, the Paleo-Indians used stones that they chipped into shapes. These tools included scrapers for preparing materials, knives for cutting, and unique points, like the Clovis point, for hunting. Our understanding of early human presence in the Americas relies heavily on archaeological findings. One prominent site from the Paleo-Indian era is the Blackwater Draw site near Clovis, New Mexico. Notably, this archaeological site is where the discovery of significant leaf-shaped Clovis points originated. During the mid-20th century, numerous excavations at Clovis period sites led to Clovis points becoming pivotal artifacts, defining the Paleo-Indian era in North America. Anthropologists considered the Clovis culture compelling evidence of the earliest human presence in the Americas supporting the prevailing Clovis First Hypothesis. For a significant portion of the century, the Clovis First Hypothesis dominated archaeological perspectives, dismissing evidence dating back further than approximately 10,000 BCE as unreliable. Nevertheless, as more sites yielded credible older dates and the coastal migration theory gained broader acceptance, the influence of the Clovis First movement waned. As stated earlier, the Monte Verde site in Chile challenged the idea that the first people in the Americas were from the Clovis culture. The archaeology there revealed things like wood and hide structures, clay-lined fire pits, and many plant remains from the diets of early inhabitants. They even found fossilized human feces, backing up the evidence of what people ate. 
One fascinating find was a preserved child's footprint near a fire pit. The Vero Man site in Florida is also enjoyable. It's one of the rare places where they found human bones alongside the bones of big animals like bison, mastodon, giant sloth, dire wolf, llama, and camel. They also found remains of smaller animals like deer. The site dates back to around 12 to 14,000 years ago. Around 8500 to 8000 BCE, the Folsom culture emerged in the Great Plains region, marking a distinctive cultural tradition among Paleo-Indians. Within the vast territories of the Great Plains and extending into portions of the Southwest, Paleo-Indians, particularly the Folsom, crafted a way of life intricately tied to bison hunting. Unlike some of their counterparts who relied on other large game animals, the Folsom Indians adapted ingeniously to the fluctuating weather conditions of North America. Bison transformed into grass eaters and found sustenance in the flourishing grasslands of the Great Plains. The Folsom people's innovative approach to survival included the development of distinctive projectile points. Compared to their Clovis predecessors, Folsom hunters created shorter, narrower points with fluting on both sides. This marked a departure from earlier technologies, showcasing higher craftsmanship and precision. Indeed, the Folsom peoples emerged as arguably the most skilled stoneworkers in ancient North America, leaving a lasting legacy in the archaeological record. North America underwent significant changes from about 8,000 to 4,000 BCE because the weather got warmer. The end of the Ice Age meant glaciers melted, making the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. The east got covered in trees, the plains turned into grassy lands, and the west mainly became deserts. This shift gave early people better places to live and more types of plants and animals to use for food. Around 7,000 BCE, a significant shift took place in Mesoamerica as farming began. Early indigenous communities in present-day Mexico, specifically in Tamaulipas, Tehuacan, and the Valley of Oaxaca, started experimenting with growing plants like beans, pumpkins, peppers, and gourds. While their early farming methods yield a small amount of food, roughly 5% of their diet, hunting wild game and gathering wild plants remain their primary sources of sustenance. Simultaneously, around 7,000 BCE to the Common Era I, the Cochise Desert culture emerged in the American Southwest, specifically in what is now Arizona and Western New Mexico. The people of this culture, distinct from the Clovis and Folsom cultures to the east, adopt a nomadic lifestyle, traveling in small bands and dwelling in caves and rock shelters. Unlike their eastern counterparts, the Cochisa people rely more on gathering wild plant foods than hunting. Early Cochis settlements feature tools like scrapers and milling stones for grinding seeds. As time progresses, projectile points indicate an increasing interest in hunting, and early forms of maize found at these sites suggest initial attempts at farming. The Cochise desert culture is a foundational influence for later, more advanced southwestern farming cultures, including the Mogollon and Hohokam, paving the way for agricultural developments in the region. Around 3000 to 2500 BCE, a significant cultural development known as the Old Copper Culture took root in the Great Lakes region. Archaic Indians, active in the Great Lakes region, initiated this cultural shift upon discovering copper deposits along the shores of Lake Superior. Equipped with simple tools, these resourceful individuals easily extract chunks and sheets of copper. They progress in their metalworking skills, initially shaping the copper through chipping and hammering and later employing heat to make it more malleable. These communities fashion various tools and weapons using this raw copper material, including projectile points and axe blades, crafting shiny bracelets, beads, and other ornaments. These copper items, showcasing utility and aesthetic appeal, gain significance as luxury goods within an emerging trade network spanning the eastern woodlands. 
This trade network, developing from around 1000 BCE to 200 CE, facilitates the exchange and appreciation of these crafted copper goods across the region. Thousands of years after the migration of early peoples from Asia to North America across the Bering Land Bridge, a significant chapter unfolds with the arrival of the ancestors of the Aleut and Inuit in the continent. Unlike their predecessors who traversed the Bering Land Bridge, these newcomers likely employed small skin or wooden boats to navigate the strait. This waterway formed after the polar ice caps melted after the last ice age, which submerged the land bridge. The migratory journey of the Aleut and Inuit ancestors led them to settle across the Arctic region and the Aleutian Islands, situated off the southwest coast of present-day Alaska. This migration marks a distinctive chapter in North American prehistory, shaping the cultural landscapes of the Arctic and the Aleutian Archipelago. It is noteworthy that, due to the comparatively later arrival of their ancestors in North America, the modern Aleut and Inuit exhibit closer genetic ties to Asians than to indigenous peoples of the continent. This connection underscores the complexity and diversity of human migrations, emphasizing the rich tapestry of cultures that emerged across the vast expanses of North America over millennia. Around 2000 BCE, the early Aleut and Inuit people, who had been in North America for about a thousand years, started developing different ways of life. The ancestors of today's Aleut and Inuit have distinct cultures. The early Aleut settled on the Aleutian Islands, a long chain off the coast of Alaska. The Aleutian Islands have a warmer, windier, and wetter environment compared to the frozen Arctic where the Inuit live. While both the Aleut and Inuit are skilled hunters, they organize their villages differently. The Aleut communities have a social structure where people are ranked based on their social position and wealth, similar to how some Indian communities on the northwest coast of the United States organize themselves. This cultural difference shows how the environment and where people live can shape their society's development over time. An overview into major pre-Columbian civilizations of Mesoamerica before European contact. Pre-Columbian Native American civilizations were diverse and sophisticated, with complex social, political, economic, and cultural systems. Several advanced societies thrived across the Americas before the arrival of Christopher Columbus. Among these, the Maya, Aztec, and Inca civilizations stand out for their sophistication, ingenuity, and cultural richness. The Mayan civilization began as early as 1500 BCE, when they settled in villages and practiced agriculture. The classic period of Mayan culture lasted from about 250 CE until about 900 CE, during which time Mayan civilization comprised more than 40 cities each with a population between 5,000 and 50,000. Flourishing in the tropical lowlands of present-day Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador, the Maya left an indelible mark on the region with their monumental achievements in architecture, mathematics, and social organization. The Maya developed an elaborate system of hieroglyphic writing highly sophisticated calendrical and astronomical systems, and made paper from the inner bark of wild fig trees. They also developed an elaborate and beautiful tradition of sculpture and relief carving. Mayan religion was based on a pantheon of nature gods, including those of the sun, the moon, rain, and corn, and a priestly class was responsible for an elaborate cycle of rituals and ceremonies. Mayan astronomy underlies a complex calendar involving an accurately determined solar year, a sacred calendar of 260 days, and various longer cycles culminating in the long count. The peak Mayan population may have reached 2 million people, most of whom settled in the lowlands of Guatemala. After 900 CE, the classic Maya civilization declined precipitously, leaving the great cities and ceremonial centers vacant and overgrown with jungle vegetation. 
Some scholars have suggested that armed conflicts and the exhaustion of agricultural land were responsible for the sudden decline. During the post-classic period between 900 and 1519, cities in the Yucatan Peninsula flourished for several centuries after the great cities of lowland Guatemala had become depopulated. Today, most Mayans are nominal Roman Catholics, though many have converted to evangelical Protestantism, and their Christianity is generally overlaid upon the native religion. From 1345 to 1521, the Aztec civilization was a significant power in Mesoamerica, with its capital city of Tenochtitlan, situated in present-day Mexico City. The Aztecs excelled in various domains, such as agriculture, trade, art, and architecture. They constructed remarkable temple pyramids, employed advanced agricultural methods, and had a well-documented society with elaborate religious customs and institutions. The Aztecs believed in many gods and did special ceremonies where they sacrificed people to make their gods happy. They thought offering a person's heart showed respect to the gods. Their primary god was Quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent who they believed created the world and brought rain. Besides their religion, the Aztecs liked art and collected it from different cultures. They mixed different art styles, creating a colorful and diverse cultural scene. But then, in 1519, Spanish explorers led by Hernán Cortés arrived. They made friends with some of the Aztecs' enemies and fought against the Aztecs. Eventually, in 1521, the Aztecs' capital, Tenochtitlan, was defeated, and the Aztec Empire fell. This was a significant change for the Aztecs, and the arrival of the Europeans led to the end of their mighty empire. Even though the Aztecs are gone, we still see their influence in Mexico's culture today. The Inca civilization flourished in ancient Peru between 1400 and 1533 CE and was the largest empire in the Americas and the world. The Incas conquered people and exploited landscapes in diverse settings, including plains, mountains, deserts, and tropical jungles. They were known for their unique art and architecture, constructing finely built buildings and adapting natural landscapes with terracing, highways, and mountaintop settlements. The Incas were brought into existence at Tiwanaku by the sun god Inti, and their ruler was Inti's representative. The first Incas settled in the valley of Cuzco, where they established the Inca capital, Cuzco, with the help of stone warriors. At its height, the Inca Empire spanned over 2,500 miles along South America's western coast, encompassing present-day Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Chile, and Colombia. The Inca established a highly efficient road network, the Capac Ñan, connecting the diverse regions of their empire. The Inca Empire was a highly organized and centralized state. The ruler, the Sapa Inca, held political and religious authority. The empire was divided into administrative units called provinces, each governed by a noble appointed by the Sapa Inca. A system of tribute and labor obligations sustained the empire. The Inca were renowned for their exceptional engineering skills, particularly in constructing impressive stone structures without mortar. Machu Picchu, a mountain citadel, is a testament to their architectural prowess. The site was a royal estate and religious center, showcasing finely crafted stonework and an intricate layout. Without a doubt, digging into America's ancient past reveals a fascinating story of Native American history that goes way beyond the Colombian era. Exploring the civilizations that existed before Columbus arrived challenges what we know about how things were in the past. As you can tell, these ancient societies had their unique ways of living, advanced knowledge, and complex societies, showing us that Native American cultures were rich and diverse long before Europeans showed up. If you're yet to give us a thumbs up, kindly do so without hesitation. Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button for more videos.
Thank you for watching.